By the way, my name is Vinod Vidu, and I work for a company called Oceanet. Um, I'm the director of strategic initiatives. Um, I live in Houston, Texas. The location is important as I go through my story. I think it's up. Um, so I'd like to tell you my story. So if you want a good life, you should become an engineer, doctor, or lawyer. This is the advice that I grew up with in India. But as I, I looked at it, I looked at it a little bit more carefully, and I thought, this is the real message. <laughs> so with that precious advice in my mind, I went and finished my undergraduate degree. And as I was finishing my undergraduate degree, most of my friends, they went into a computer program and became computer programmers. And I was the last one to become this guy. I didn't want to grow up and become a computer program because I thought, no offense to the computer programmers out there, but I thought it's a boring approach. I also, I was inspired by the fact that inventions can change the world and make the world a better place, but I didn't know how to become a part of this entire process. So I decided to continue my education. So I came to the United States, did my master's in Florida, and then I went for my PhD in Hawaii. Locations are important here. <laughs> So as I was going through this entire process of my PhD or just beginning of the process, and we were, I was just doing composite materials till then, and we were just doing the regular work, you know, breaking something in the lab, taking the data, analyzing it, the regular things. So it's, a, again, you know, just increasing my boredom, right? I looked like a bored guy, <laughs> but no, I'm excited now. Now, during the, the, the PhD process, uh, early days of my PhD, we were exposed to an interesting problem about composite materials. So if you're not familiar with composite materials, but I'm pretty sure you heard of this Dreamliner or Boeing 787. Most of these airplanes these days, they love to use composite materials. Basically, it's nothing but a fiber mat um, glued together. So layers of this fiber, they stack them up, and then they glue glued together with the polymer. But there is a big challenge with these materials because there is nothing in the true thickness direction because it's the fibers are in 2D and they're very strong in these directions, but nothing in this direction. So it would be great. So we thought it would be great to have something that reinforces in this direction. So we thought we can grow these nanotubes, such as, as you can see here, in the true thickness direction because those are the strongest fibers available, and stack them together and then do the same work. So we were working on this for a couple of months in Hawaii, and it was not going anywhere. And I actually remember the computer guy was much better. His life was much better, even though it was boring. And what happened is that as we were going through this process, I called this professor, this, this godfather type figure in nanotechnology at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI in Troy, New York. He said that, that's a great idea. Why don't you come over here, work in our lab? And it, by the way, this is going to be incredibly fun. The moment I heard that word fun, I just was so super excited. I said, okay, the research can be fun now, right? So I left this place, Honolulu, Hawaii, <laughs> <laughs> where we always speak about sand, surf, sun. That's what we speak about all the time, right? And then I landed in this incredibly better place. As soon as I left the airport, this is what I found. <laughs> Troy, New York. Welcome to Troy, New York. So, you know, my feeling just went from this to this. <laughs> so I'm generally bored <laughs> and I'm depressed at this point. But a good thing came out from that because, because it was so cold and nothing else to do, I was glued into the lab and I just had to work, nothing else to do. So what we did was we actually made this, this, this we used this fabric and then put them inside a furnace a very high temperature furnace. And the idea was to grow these carbon nanotubes on these fabrics. We were pumping hydrocarbons, so the idea was that it would separate and carbon would pile up on the fiber and it would look like a carpet. So for a while, we actually put this fiber in horizontal direction and in vertical direction in the fabric. Nothing happened, no nothing. So I thought, at some point, I thought, you know, what do I lose? Why don't we just take some of these fibers instead of the entire fabric and put some inside the furnace and then see what happens. We'll take the first step. And as we finish this process, again, the same process, as we finish this process, these fibers were looking different. It had something black on it. Oh, okay, so we looked at inside the microscope. 
what we found was very interesting. We had some very intrigue, uh, you know, interesting architecture of, of some materials built on it. So we did some analysis and stuff. What we found was fascinating. There was carbon nanotubes grown on this fiber in a very engineered architecture. That was very, very exciting. It was very compelling because this is for the first time that we are showing that carbon nanotubes or the carbon molecules can be arranged in a very defined fashion. We were arranging it in a very defined fashion to the point that we could actually precisely control it to make and mimic um, a, a toilet brush to a kitchen brush to a toothbrush. Anything you want. So we can design molecules at this point, or carbon nanotubes on a, on a surface. So these were the pioneering works that, that, that is introduced for the first time. So I went from here to here, and I stayed there. <laughs> so I'm now no bored, and I'm excited. And so, so this actually, it was very interesting that I had that mustache too those days. So I shaved off. So, <clears throat> and then what happened was, we looked at these materials a little bit more carefully. We saw that these carbon nanotubes are thousands of, thousands of times thinner than the human hair. And the Guinness Book of World Records recognized it as the smallest nanotube brush device ever made. Well, that was interesting. And then I told my grandpa, uh, grandmother, and she said, well, that's really interesting. What does that really mean? I said, I get to be with these famous people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I'm with these famous people in this world, so that, that's the different part of the excitement. And we had compelling papers. We had uh, two um, very high impact papers coming out of it. We had patents on it. We had commercialization efforts going on. So all the interesting stuff. So I was actually getting a very good exposure to the world of nanotechnology. And then by the way, we solved this problem too. So we had this fiber mat that we be began with, and then we were able to grow carbon nanochips on it like a carpet. So we solved our problem. So, but to me, it was a big, big exposure of science, and I took that excitement. And now I understood the meaning of the, the thing that the guy was talking about. He said it's fun, and I thought like you know, he was drinking something different then. But now I understand the value of fun in science, right? It actually carried me to further in, in invention um, in smart, making a smart cement that can sense, that can see, that can sense somebody stepping on it by itself or a drag resistant or a super hydrophobic coating that can do applications in medical and all kinds of areas. Or an unmanned system that is made of nanocomposite materials that's super strong. Or even a, a fuel cell that's highly efficient, reduces the amount of platinum used and the cost. Or a self-healing coating. But I think there was something missing. These are all commercially highly valuable, and we are doing all these works, and we are actually going through the business process and stuff. But it was still missing something. I'm not communicating with the, the broader people there. I'm not making a, a change in their life. I'm not saying how nanotechnology can impact their regular life. So we went ahead and we looked at it. Oh, what can we do in Hawaii? Oh, we made the first nano surfboard. Using nanotechnology, we increased the strength of a surfboard and made it ding resistant and all the other stuff, so it was very popular. But then I was thinking about this whole process again, that I was trained in science and technology, and I knew that you know, to change the world, there should be the people part. And so I had to make sure that I excite, I, I transfer my enthusiasm to the next generation of scientists, engineers, and innovators really the young people. So I started going to schools. I started going to radio shows. I started going, talking to everybody, every outlet's out there. At some point, a producer found me and he said, why don't we just do this for the broader audience? Why don't we do a TV show? I thought that's really interesting. I didn't know what to do on TV. But we launched a TV show. It's called Weird Science with Dr. V, and I being the Dr. V. And you see, my mustache is there in, that, in the logo. <laughs> so that was really, really exciting. And during those days, about these 10 kids came to me from a totally unknown public school. And they said, we are going to be in the first robotics competition. So I said, that's interesting. And what do I do? And then he said, they said, can you be our mentor in this process? I said, oh, that sounds, that sounds interesting. So I became the mentor, because especially that year, the theme was nanotechnology, right? 
So these kids, they, they just wanted to qualify the district competition. And this school is totally unheard of, this public school. And <clears throat> I worked with them for three months. Every weekend, myself and my wife would go with, make some Indian sweets and then share with them and then have fun. So three months we volunteered and then worked with them. These kids started, qualified the district competition. They went to the state and then they qualified for the national competition. And they actually went to the, qualified for the international competition. Now, for the international competition, they were competing about 10,000 10, participants, 94 teams, 23 countries. And I still remember this pretty interesting, very, very satisfying phone call that I received that day from this girl who was leading this team. Her name is Anna. She said, Dr. V, I thought something happened, really bad happened in Atlanta because that's where the international competition was happening. Dr. V, do you have a minute? I said, absolutely, go ahead. I said, what happened? Did you mess up anything? No, we won the competition. They won the Universal Design Award competition that year. Think about it. It is very, very satisfying to, to, to communicate and share your excitement so that you can excite, engage, educate, and empower the next generation of scientists and engineers in this world. And that's very important. So that's my story of Nano Brush sweeping away the boredom of my life <laughs> okay, and then opening me up to the world. So if you, are, if you are bored, just don't give up. Keep doing it. If you're stuck in one direction, look at the other direction, things will happen. That's my story. But when I shared this story yesterday with other ambassadors and this Hollywood director who was actually trying to help us, he said, ah, that's not the story that we want to hear. What happened to this? <laughs> you know? So that's me. Thank you so much. <laughs>